Brought to you by Ripple Industries. So in terms of the direction of Bankfed, I think we're at an age where everything is going to become more realistic. As far as I'm concerned, I think Bankfed paintball is the most realistic type of paintball you can play. Um, no, you know, no digs against hoppers, but realism is about having this football on top of your marker. That's not real at all. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate right now about box bags and drum bags and whether or not that's part of Bankfed. To me, it is because I think that's part of the realism. You know, in real life, you know, you have squads that have, you know, saws. You have squad automatic weapons. But not everybody can carry one of those. So I think if you limit its use in, in proportion to what it is in real life, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, I think you'll see more things like rocket launchers and stuff, you know, people, people using that. I've seen the rise of it, you know. I think there's a demand, but it's never gotten really big. In terms of just mag fit, you know, shooting with a magazine, I think that concept is so widely, widely accepted now that the market's built. And I think more and more people are going to go back to this format. To me, this is grassroots paintball. It's like when I was, you know, 17, 18 years old, I actually didn't get into paintball because there was no realism in paintball for me, you know. There was a bunch of guys in neon jerseys and space guns that never appealed to me. I'm actually an ex-airsoft guy, and I think what I bring to, to MagPet is that extra level of realism. I don't think there's so much a next big thing that, that I'm doing. Um, I've never thought of MagPet as, as something that's inside the box. Um, when I first started this journey, um, the paintball industry didn't want to, to have anything to do with us. And now that we're having so much success, everybody's watching us very closely. And in a way, I don't have a formula. It's like I see something, I see a new niche, I just jump into it. Um, I don't have any preconceptions, I don't have any formula. Um, it's just what comes naturally to me. It's like I see what's happening in the real steel world, I see what's happening in the airsoft world, and say, well, nobody's doing this in paintball yet. Now go do it. You know, I could be making, you know, an AK next or bullpup next, things that I'd say I wouldn't make. I might make, because I'll eventually run out of things to make. And things that don't appeal to me today may appeal to me tomorrow. You don't know. And I think that's the fun in it, in this, you know, I, I'm passionate about what I do. So when an idea to me that, that is not so cool to me at first will, will slowly pull me into, into it. You know, like pistols. I might do a pistol next year. Everybody wants, seems to want one right now. Well, Milsic pistol, Milsic pistol. Not this year, maybe next year, maybe the next year after. Don't know. Um, like I said, there's there's really no formula in how I plan my products and what I do. It's just, I change according to the market. The market's changing, I'll change and adapt to it. And that's it. In terms of MagFed games, I think the Milsic Direct distributors will not only attend MagFed only games, we're also working with a lot of partners who are running games, but they get our support. So even though we might not physically be there, we're going to support it. And uh, I know for a fact that Doug in the States are going to a couple of really big um, non MagFed games, but I think our products now don't only attract people that play MagFed. And um, I think overall, all three distributors added together, you're going to see us attend almost 30 games, if not more. So we will make our presence felt. I think, you know, the Milsic business has shaped me as a person. Um, obviously, I went through a lot of ups and downs in the duration of this business. But this year, I, I feel like I've finally found the the balance 
And the people I'm working with now are the greatest team that I've ever had. And it's actually more enjoyable for me. You know, it is a business, but I actually have a lot of fun doing it. And I watch these people grow. You know, I am partly responsible for their well beings because they're doing this for the living. And uh, when they're growing and when they're doing well, it makes me feel good about what I'm doing. And that motivates me to do even better. You know, um, I don't really get down on all the negative stuff, the stuff on Facebook, you know, people talk. They can they say whatever they want to say. But I'll keep my head down and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I don't respond to people, I respond to myself. And that's it. Product development and manufacturing is actually a living animal. Um, there are challenges to it from every day. My days sometimes are four or five hours long, sometimes are 16 hours long. And there's constantly fires to put out. I would not say there's a problem with product development. There's no single problem. There's just problems that overlap. And I've gotten used, so used to dealing with it, it's just water off a of duck's back. I don't really fret on it, you know. There's a problem, I fix it. And over the years, I've developed a technique where I could get ahead of problems. I can see something happening before it happens. It's not like I'm some Zen master you see in the future. You, you develop these patterns where you, you can predict that something is going to go wrong. And you learn from customer feedbacks. So like, you know that something is going to break before it actually breaks because Someone out there will break it for you. And you know that's a weak point, you address it. And I think over the course of running this company, we have learned that it is very important to constantly update and improve the product. Like, it's, you know, other companies get into generation this, generation that, mod one, mod two, mod three. It's all BS. There's always something wrong with the product that you always need to fix because your customers will find new ways of breaking your products. And over time, you just realize that, okay, well, you have to over-engineer everything. The challenge actually is to over-engineer something so much while keeping the cost down because you could make something completely bulletproof, but you price yourself out of the market. And I think right now, um, the challenge for me is always to find that balance. And uh, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell, is to make the product as good as possible while keeping it as, you know, giving as good value as you can to the product.